Hey class, since we're just reviewing 14.1 and 2 today, I wanted to just hold class remotely rather than uh, on campus because of all the stuff going on with the air and whatnot. So just wanted to uh, kind of go through a few cool proofs. If you remember this new unit, quote unquote new, uh, we'll include the two sections from chapter 14 that we just tested on, and that included mostly... Uh, perimeter stuff both on polygons and circles and arcs and things of that nature and then also the area or space inside so what I wanted to start off today with is also going over some of the stuff about area uh, giving you guys a few proofs on what area is and how we can both relate it to algebra and geometry even though this is mostly a geometry unit so I wanted to start with a couple of squares here and I wanted to ask you guys the question what is a plus b quantity squared equal to? So if I was to write a plus b quantity squared well we know anything squared means we have that thing times itself. So in this case we have an a plus b times an a plus b. Now most people know this as foiling. I like to teach it as distributing twice because that's what we do when we have something times itself and in parentheses. So I'm going to start by taking this a and multiplying it times that a. So now I'm going to have a squared. Then when I distribute the a to the b, I get a positive a times b. Now when I do that with the b and I distribute it to the a, we typically write it in alphabetical order. So that would also be another a times b or b times a. And then when I do b times b, we get b squared. So when simplifying that, you actually get a new better form, simpler form, of a squared plus two a b's, that's one here and one there, plus b squared. So we know this is the product or result of this a plus b quantity squared. So now what I'd like to do is show you what that means geometrically. So I'd like to go ahead and draw what that means geometrically, which obviously is a square. So what is a plus b squared as a geometric shape? It's a square with length or one side, a plus b. So if we're going to draw this ourselves, then we draw some length and then match it. For all four sides. That then is a length of a plus b which I will then label this distance from here to here a and then from here to here will be b. And then I can do that throughout in any way that I want. Let's say that this right here is our distance B again, and then this here is A. And then on the top, uh, we'll label those again as a distance of A. So I got to match it up with the bottom there. And then same thing here as B. So I get my whole square of, let me match it up over here as well. Same as the left side. of a length of a plus b from here to here. And so we know already that, which I just did previously algebraically, the whole area or space inside is a length of, we'll highlight it over here in blue, 
a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So we already know that this right here should be how much space is inside. Well then, let me cut this up a little bit differently. I'm going to go ahead and see that this is a length of a on the left and this is a length of a on the right. So if I cut this up right here, that and then same thing on the top and the bottom, I see that's a length of a all the way down to here, that's a length of a. Well then, you notice that I've just created another little square. This right here, therefore, would be a times a to get the area inside, which is a squared. And this in the bottom right would also be a base and height or length and width of b times b, which is b squared. Now if you look, there's also two other shapes for the total area inside. And those together are rectangles. And we know that that is the base times the height or length times width again, which in this case is a times b. And this one also is a times b. So I've br broken it into four different little areas, which, as you can see, actually gives me a total area of a squared for this one, plus the two rectangles, which happen to be the exact same area. So I got plus two ABs, plus that other little square in the bottom right, which is B squared. And that, as you can see, is the exact same thing we got over here. So nice little connection of the algebraic and geometric way to represent these. Now, just for fun, I'm gonna show you one more version of this, a little bit differently. And I'm gonna take this square again, of length a plus b. Let me try to match it up to the one I already have over there to the left. And again, if I told you that this is a length of a plus b, then since it's a square, all four sides have that length. And this time what I'm going to do is cut it up a little bit differently. This time I'm going to label the bottom left here as that length of b and then from there over is going to be a length of a and I'm going to continue this trend all the way around b and then a length of a for the remaining part and then again from here to there a length of b and then from here over a length of A, and then again, a length of B. With another length of A. So now I have a square again with length A plus B, which again would be A plus B quantity squared if we were to take the side times the side or length times width base times height. So we know that we should get the same result. But this time I'm going to draw a little bit differently and I'm going to draw a new length. And I'm going to create from one of my A's all the way over to a B. And I'm going to do that throughout. So from this little B to the end of that A and then this little B to the end of that A and then this little B to the end of that A. And if you've noticed, I've created what appears to be a square, forgive my drawing, um, which we don't know the length of that. You can see we've actually created some triangles within it. And so what we're gonna do is, we're gonna make sure that we know, okay, well, these are all right angles because it's a square, right? So we've created four right triangles, and inside, we've created a square. And now that we see that we have the four right triangles, I'm going to also label those green side lengths as a length of some other hypotenuses, I guess you would say, for each one of those four right triangles. And so 
if you can see that since those are all the same lengths, because obviously I drew them from the same triangle, A and B side lengths, then we can now take these and find the area. Now we have four triangles, and then we have this square on the inside. So this square right here is obviously going to be an area of length times width, base times height, or C squared. And then all four of these triangles are all going to have the same area because they are the exact same triangles. And so with that, we're going to now have four of our triangle, which is one half the base times the height. Plus, we are going to have our square, our large square, which is C squared. Now, we know that this should be equal to A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And that's what we're going to use right now to come up with something a little bit different. So watch, this, this is kind of cool. So the base of each one of those triangles is either A or B, depending on how or which one you're looking at. But that's why we have to have that perpendicular right angle to get our base and our height. So when we multiply all of this out, we know we can do 4 times 1 half, which we know half of 4 is 2AB. And then over here, we still have our C squared. And we know that that is equal to the area on the inside, which we did both algebraically and geometrically a second ago and said it was equal to this. A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. And if you notice, there is something that both sides of this equation have in common. So what I'm going to do is actually subtract 2AB to both sides which we can do because it's an equation as long as we do it equally it'll stay equal because then that cancels out our two ab's and what we're left with on one side is a squared plus b squared equals on the other side c squared and hopefully that looks and sounds familiar to you that my friends is what we call that's right you probably already said it the Pythagorean theorem now this is just one of over 375 proofs that are out there. So I wanted to show you how area can be used both algebraically, geometrically, and then with that second square that we used, we can actually use it to come up with the Pythagorean theorem. So now what I'm going to do is kind of go over some other stuff with you all and just review 14.1 and 2. But I just wanted to add a little bit more to the lecture for today uh, before we just jumped into the review. So this right here is just a couple of example problems that we may have seen before in the past and just uh, some that are a little bit different uh, just as a quick review to prepare you for the homework and just to remind you that this is going to be in this fourth and final unit as well. So on this first question I want you to find both the exact and approximate of the circumference of a circle with a radius of two inches. Okay, so the first thing you need to make sure that you know is we're looking for the circumference. And the circumference, you need to know the formula for that. And the formula for circumference is, hopefully you remember, 2 pi r. So the only thing that we really need to know is what the radius is. So the exact answer is going to be where the circumference, we usually use capital C for that, is equal to 2 times pi times our radius r. Now I told you that the radius for this particular problem is 2 inches. So when we do that, that is now going to give us an exact answer of 4 pi inches. 
Now, if we wanted to approximate that, we would then have to take that and multiply what we know pi is approximately. And usually we use the squiggly equal sign for approximately. Once we have that, we can then go ahead and figure out, well, we had four times pi, which we can either type in that symbol or put pi to represent that. And then with that, we want to actually approximate what that is. So in this case, we know pi, most people have it memorized, to at least two decimal places. So we now have four times that 3.14. And that would then give us the approximate value of this rather than just saying the exact answer is four pi. So I should actually put this as a strictly equal sign that is the exact value, and then the approximate value would be, if you punch that in your calculator, which I will let you use a calculator on this test, it will be 12.56. And again, make sure you put your units in correctly. We're finding the circumference, which is the distance around, therefore it would be in inches. So we have our exact answer. which would be the strictly equal to, and then we have our approximate, which we then take and approximate what pi is, and then get our approximate value out. So pretty easy, just make sure you pay attention to what they're asking for on my math lab, and then we'll look at a few different scenarios that we can use within this. And then we will move on to number two. Find the radius of a circle given the circumference is 74 pi meters. So this time uh, we're going to work backwards from what we just did. And these are the types of questions that you may see on the CBEST. Uh, because they used to give you ones like number one, but then they had to keep changing it to make it different for the next generation and the next people to have taken that test. So it's not always the same because you know how tests will leak out and you guys I'm sure have found things on the web to study for that test. Um, if not, you should look up some questions on the CBEST. But in order to find the radius of a circle given the circumference is this. Again, we know that the circumference equation is C equals 2 pi r. And in reality, there's only two variables within this. There's the C and the r. So they're going to have to give you one of them. And in this case, they give us the C and we're going to have to use that to find our r. Okay, so in this case, we're going to go ahead and undo what's being done to the r. And don't forget, we're also going to replace what they told us their circumference is, which they told us is 74 pi. Now, they're giving us the exact answer, which is quite all right, because it works out really, really well for us because what is being done to the r is it is being multiplied by 2 pi. So to undo that, we'll go ahead and divide both sides by 2 pi, which anything divided by itself we know is 1. So those cancel out and give us our radius. And what's left on the other side is, well, pi over pi is 1. Anything divided by itself again is 1. And then we just have to take half of 74. And I know what half of 70 is, it's 35. And I also know what half of 4 is, it's 2. So 35 and 2 is a total of 37. And again, make sure you put your units correctly. That would be meters. And that's how we would attack a problem like that. Again, just having to know the circumference. So I'm trying to give you guys a little bit different look than what we've already done in the past, but now let's move to number three. Still going over the same type of stuff that we saw and did in this 14.1 and 14.2, and so far it's all been from 14.1, but here's a third option of this type. What happens to the circumference of a circle when the length of the radius is doubled? Now we did problems like this in class already, but we were talking more about the area. So again, we're going back to our circumference equation, which we know circumference is equal to 
2 pi r. And again, that finds the circumference or distance around a circle at any length of radius. What we are now trying to do is see what happens to the circumference when these are already given. Those will always be that. We call those constants because they are constantly the same. They don't vary like a variable does. But now we're trying to put in place for our r what happens when the length of the radius is doubled, meaning that our initial radius could be whatever length, but in order to have it doubled, it would be two times as big. Don't get that confused with r squared, but two times as big. So this is being multiplied, this is being multiplied, and this is being multiplied, which means we can multiply only what we know how, and that would be the twos. So that would now give me four times pi times r. Or if you wanted our original circumference, we could have just left the four as the two times the two and just written them right next to each other. And the reason I'm writing it like this rather than the four, even though that's what that is there, is because remember we're trying to compare what our original circumference is or was when we had that original length of radius r. And when we doubled it, we wanted to see what happened to the circumference compared to the old one. And if you notice, here is our old circumference, which means it's actually become twice as big as the original circumference. And so there seems to be what is called a one-to-one -one relationship there. When we doubled the radius, we got twice as big or double the size of our circumference. Now remember with area, when we went over that earlier in class, in unit three, that was much, much different. So hopefully you guys are following those. Uh, again, those are the types of problems that you could see on the CBEST and or our fourth and final test that we'll be testing on chapter and only chapter 14. So the next type that we saw in the first two sections was the metric system and converting from one length or distance or weight with grams or liquid volume with liters, which again is really nice because they're all the same. So the only thing that we need to really know and make sure that we have memorized is how the metric system moves. And if you remember the acronym I gave you all for that, it was KIDS, sorry that's a bad K, KIDS hate doing math during Christmas morning. And I emphasize the M in the middle, the math, because that is our units. Whether it's meters, liters, or grams, it just depends on what we're measuring. Everything else is the prefix or the quantity of the unit, the meter, the liter, or the gram that you have. Now remember the only difficult one is the fact that we have the two Ds. So the one that's worth more, which are all the things to the left of our decimals to the right, we're going to use the deca, the A for. And then basically all you have to do for each one of these is realize that this is a HM or hectometer. And we need to go to the, in this case, since it's the D without the extra, it's the one that's worth less since it has less. And that's this D. And since we are starting at the H, we know that we need to move this thing one, two, three decimal places from where it currently is. So that would be one, two, and three would have to put a zero, which already looks like it's there. So our answer would be 370 decimeters. And so the nice part is every single one of these are done the same way, but again, I just wanted to throw in a quick review with you all. This time we're going from centimeters to kilometers. And the same thing would have been for if this was instead of an M and an M for meters, a distance that we're measuring, if it was grams, a weight that we're measuring, or liters, a liquid volume that we're measuring. We still would just go from our original C that they're giving us, and we would have to move it one, two, three, four, five places to the left 
in order to get now that means we have to include the decimal because they did not on this one like they did in the previous so that means we're gonna go one two three four and five places to the left which means we're gonna have to add in a zero and then that means we do not need the zeros at the end so we're going to put I like to put zero point so people know where the decimal is but it's not necessary zero eight four which again makes sense we're not going to need as many kilometers as we do centimeters because that is a much larger distance than that and remember we talked about the distances and how to compare them all a millimeter is about the width of a paperclip centimeter about the width of a fingernail and then a meter from one shoulder to the opposite stretched out arm is about a meter's length. Kilometer we know we can compare that's closer to a mile. All right. So the last one I wanted to go over with you guys just for practice was the fact that we are moving from the D A M to the M M. So again the M is the measurement in this case meters and we need to this time go from D A to M. So this time we will be starting from the DA, which is the one just to the left there. And we're going to have to move that to the right to get to the little m. Remember, not this big n, that's the one that actually is our measurement. So we're going to have to go one, two, three, four places to the right. Again, they did not give us a decimal, so we'll have to include it And one two, three, four places to the right, which means we have to add in quite a few zeros, four to be exact, because of the placement of our decimal. So this time we'll have seven, five, one, two, three, four zeros. And as requested, I would like you guys so that we can read that number more quickly, put commas every time we have three digits. So in this case, 750,000 millimeters. So pretty easy stuff. Most of you did pretty well on that on the test, but want to make sure that you have it down because I could include something like that or something like this that we saw in our notes, uh, like number five, where I have you place a decimal in the proper position that would make it make sense. So if we're talking about a professional basketball player in centimeters, that is something that we would compare to in inches. But usually we do feet and inches, not just inches, because it's easier to do that. So remember, a centimeter is about the width of a finger. So what would make sense? How many fingers tall do you think a basketball player would be? Definitely not 1.95 or 19.5. 1,950 even is a lot if we think about putting our fingers together and lining them and stacking them up from head to toe. So 195 in this case seems like it would be the proper choice. How about a refrigerator? What do you think about that? How many meters? And again, compare, we don't have a feel, but we're trying to get one. Centimeters, finger width. How about the meter? We said that's about from our shoulder to an outstretched arm in the opposite direction. Well, then how many of those can you imagine yourself measuring to the top of your refrigerator? And hopefully you come up with about 17? Nah, 1.75 seems like it would make more sense. Almost 2 meters. 17 is too many, and 0.175 is not enough. So 1.75 meters on that one. How about the speed limit? Now we're talking about per hour usually. We are miles per hour. But since we're in the metric system, we cannot deal with miles, feet, yards, inches. That's all our imperial system. So we're going to use kilometers per hour. Now remember, a kilometer is comparable to a mile. But obviously one is a little bit longer than the other. So think about this. Obviously, the first thing that would come to mind is probably 73 kilometers per hour. But as we know, when you run a 5K kilometers, that is actually equivalent to only 3.2 miles. So we know that the kilometer it takes more 
than a mile does for our distance. So 73 seems about right because we know that the miles is therefore going to be less. All right. And then the last one here, I just wanted to throw out the weight of a gram because we talked about the uh, lengths, but we also discussed weights and a two liter bottle of usually soda that people know. So you can have some comparison for the liters and the grams as well. But remember we said that a gram is about the weight of a standard size paperclip. So just want to throw in some review on that stuff. Again, pretty simple. Please don't make mistakes on it because I know we don't have a feel for it, but it's much, much nicer than our system. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to review with you all was the fact that we talked about the triangle and not only do we use it a lot to come up with different area formulas for the different polygons, but we also discussed sometimes you can't even make or create a triangle with the side lengths given. So in triangle ABC, tell which is greater and why. And I put drawing it may help so that you can see that it doesn't matter how you label it, but in order to draw it, remember this is the triangle inequality theorem, which most of you nailed on the test, so no worries here, but wanted to make sure I did review it for anyone that didn't. And remember it did say that any two sides, which we usually checked the smallest two, had to be strictly greater than the third side. So this is a pretty easy problem. It's more or less just to make sure that we review it and go over most of the stuff that we talked about in 14.1 and 14.2 in general. So we're going to continue with this. Uh, I gave you guys a review homework assignment on 14.1 and 2, some of the problems that we've seen before mixed in with some newer ones, uh, hopefully more challenging ones because we've already not only done homework on it, had a lecture on it and discussed it in detail, but we've also already tested on a lot of this stuff. So do me a favor, make sure you get that done before Monday. Uh, we'll meet on Monday and go over whatever we can going forward in the new section that we have not seen before, which is 14.3. I hope to see you all then, and hopefully this was okay for not coming to class and trying something a little bit different. All right, you guys have a good one. I'll talk to you all soon. See you next class.